It's good to see you. Let's stand. We're going to sing and worship together. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Sing it with us. church family. We have one coming for baptism tonight. This is my friend Carden. 
Cardin, have you accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life? Amen. Well, buddy, based upon your public profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Good job, Cardin. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Lord, tonight we come, Lord, with grateful hearts. Lord, we thank you for those, Lord, who have had an impact, God, on the life of Cardin and who have helped point him to you to make the decision not only as the Lord and Savior of his life, but God also knowing that he needs to take his next step in believer's baptism. Lord, while tonight we gather as a church family to come and remember around your table, Lord, we look at the example of Cardin, knowing that we don't stay buried. Lord, that in you, with faith in you and your son, that Sunday's coming. We love you and we praise you. To your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dakota, and welcome to you tonight. If you're a guest with us, hope you'll find the guest card. They're there in front of you in the pew rack. Fill that out. Put it in the offering plate. We'd love to get the record of you. Know you just a little bit better uh, in days to come. But welcome uh, to this gathering together as we remember what our Lord has done for us. Grateful for Dakota being there in the baptistry of the night. The last thing we'll do in this service is that we'll ask he and his wife to come and kneel, and there'll be some uh, men that will come lay hands on him for ordination, the gospel ministry. We had our questioning here several days ago and he's been serving on our team and so we come to set him aside at the end of this service uh, tonight and uh, that'll be a wonderful way to end our family gathering around the table. During this week when you read in scripture as our Lord came into Jerusalem the crowd screamed Hail him, hail him. But in a matter of hours, that crowd turned to say, Nail him, nail him. Be certain tonight your praise continues for the King of kings and Lord of lords. And be grateful that he was willing to be nailed to the cross for us. All we do tonight points to Jesus. In just a few moments we'll take an offering. I've asked Tim Hunter to open the Word of God for a few minutes to us tonight. Then I'll come to the table and lead us in our Lord's Supper time. And so as we gather here in this place, welcome. Thank you for coming to the cross on Good Friday. John, come lead us and let's lift praise unto the Father. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us which was hostile to us and he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross he has taken it away having nailed it to the cross we remember the cross together tonight let's stand and let's sing of his cross
take our offering, I'm going to ask you to be seated. And Waldemar Petlevsky is going to come and lead us as we pray. So, Waldemar, you come join me here. And the reason that I've asked him uh, to do that is because the Kaysen's son, uh, one of their sons, Ben, is going to be going to... Uh, to hook up with Bible Mission for a year and serve in their media division over in Germany and points beyond. Uh, Valdemar is uh, the director of finance for Bible Mission, and we're grateful that he is here, and he's going to pray, and we're going to commission this young man that is taller than his daddy, blessed be the name of the Lord. And he's going to come kneel right here, and I've asked his parents, just to lay hands on him in our stead as we commission this young man to go and serve on the mission field with Bible Mission for a year. And uh, Brother Petlevsky is going to come and pray a commissioning prayer and a time of prayer for our giving. And after he says amen, we'll take our evening offering during this song. And then, Tim, you come and preach us right up to the table, and we will then honor the Lord with that. Walter, you come, my friend. Welcome. Good to have you here. And you live where? In Fulda. In Fulda, in Germany. In Germany. I thought he said Florida, and I knew that wasn't right for a moment. So we're grateful you are here. You take care of our dear friend, and uh, as big as he is, he'll take care of you, all right? (laughs) Ben, why don't you kneel just here? Mom and Dad, you come, and you symbolically pray over him for all of us. And dear friend, you come and pray God's commission on this dear mission man. Unser großer Gott, danke dir für Ben Carson, danke dir für sein offenes Herz, was er dir geöffnet hat, um in die Mission zu gehen, auch nach Deutschland. Und ich bitte dich darum, dass du ihn segnest in dieser Zeit, dass du ihn formst zu einem Werkzeug, dir zum Wohlgefallen. Bewahre du ihn auf diesem Weg, danke dir für seine Eltern, die ihn dorthin lassen und schenke ihm dort eine wunderbare Erfahrung mit dir, dass er wachsen kann in dir und dass du ihn segnest und auch seine Zukunft. Amen. Amen.
1977, August 16, 1977, a lady named Ginger Alden found a 42-year-old gentleman unresponsive on the bathroom floor. She immediately called an ambulance and he's rushed to the hospital and despite medical professionals' best effort, pronounced dead about an hour later. His name was Elvis Presley. The singer who had exploded onto the scene and reached the zenith of fame and adoration and glory, but was simply dead on a bathroom floor. Heralded as the king of rock and roll, tragically dead. Newspapers came out with a headline called, The King is Dead. And this story serves as almost an archetype of what we see happen over and over again in history. Someone powerful, someone popular, someone larger than life simply dies. Unceremoniously, tragically, shockingly. And you know what we never call those moments? Good. But we gather together as believers in Jesus Christ, as what would be called Christians, and call good the death of the man known as Jesus the Christ of Nazareth. We remember his death on a little hill called Golgotha, or the place of the skull in Jerusalem, over a couple thousand years ago, and we call it good. Why? We'll spend the next couple minutes talking about that. There's a one-sentence summary in the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that in one sentence summarizes why we call it good. It says this, For our sake, He being God, made Him, being Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the one-sentence summary. Of the cross. But in Matthew 27, if you turn your copy of God's Word there, if you have it, we see a story that takes that one sentence theological summary of the cross, and we see a 27 verse sweeping narrative that brings to life what Jesus faced. And I encourage you as we look at Matthew 27, I want to show you what it means that Jesus became sin. We're going to see in vivid detail what it means that he took on sin. And I want to encourage us as we look to the text of God's word that it will do us no good if on a Friday like this we seek to sanitize the cross. We must not sanitize the cross. We must stare at it and its brutality and it's horror if we wish to see why it's called good. Number one, I want you to see the shaming of Jesus in Matthew 27. Picking up our text in Matthew 27, verse 28, it says this, And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. The first part of this narrative is shocking if we will let it be so. Jesus is shamed by the soldiers here. Look at the wording of verse 28. It says, they stripped him. They put a scarlet robe on him in in a form of mockery, saying, okay, Jesus, you want to pretend to be king? Then sure, let's pretend for a moment. This is disrespect in the highest form. Verse 29 says that they put a crown of thorns of mockery and pain on his head. It says they twisted together this crown of thorns. Have you ever thought about the shame that was endured by Jesus? This is intense mockery, disgrace, and shame. Let's talk about shame for a moment on this Friday. Shame is one of those words that it's hard to define, but we all know it when we see it, and we all know it when we feel it. Shame has been a part of our story as humanity ever since the very beginning. In fact, this section of the text, if you're reading in Matthew 27 and you're well-versed in the Bible, you'll know that this is imagery reminding us of Genesis 3, 
when Adam and Eve had committed treason against God, disobeying his word and trusting the serpent instead of the king. And the action of sin began to work its way out. And they realized that they were stripped, that they were naked. The action of sin happened and then the effect of sin, shame, begins to come. And it's this moment of desperation and, and, and we're reading and if you're reading it for the first time, it's tragic. It's terrible because they realize they've got nothing to cover their shakenness. So they hide in the bushes and they try to put fig leaves on. You can imagine the two of them desperately trying to cover up, desperately trying to cover their shame. Shame, shame, shame. Shame. Sin produces shame. We experience shame because of sin done around us. We experience shame because of sin done to us. And we, all of us, experience shame because of sin done by us. We live in a world that produces shame. There's a cause for shame all around us. We see things that should evoke a feeling of shame within us. And then others of us, and our heart breaks where you've experienced deep shame because of something that someone else did to you. Sat with a college student this week with a story of sexual abuse in his family. Someone inflicted shame on someone. Shame. Maybe you're abused, mistreated, overlooked, condemned, mocked, or ostracized. Shame because of sin done to us. And then all of us know what it means to have shame because of sin done by us. We cower in the shadows. We fear the result if people knew the real us. That's what sin produces, shame. And then Jesus shows up and the glory of Jesus is that he then goes back to the garden to that moment when Adam and Eve uh, feel shame and he actually, in a mystery, enters it with us. All over the four Gospels, we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see Jesus over and over again, not running from shame, but running to the shameful. The disease, the tax collectors, sinners, women with issues of blood, those ostracized by uh, humanity around them, prostitutes, the poor and the Gentile. And then the cross happens. And Jesus not only goes to those who are humiliated, disgraced, and looked down upon, he actually becomes one of those. Theologian Rory Schreiner says it this way, in the crucifixion, the traffic moves in the opposite direction. This Jesus who moves so many in his life from shame to honor is himself humiliated, embarrassed, degraded, and shamed. Feel the tragedy and the shame that's happening here on the cross. The same Jesus who over and over again goes to those in shame and pulls them up, he himself, the only one who had zero reason to feel shame has willingly put himself in the seat of shame. Shamed publicly, humiliated publicly. If you want to see the weight of why we call this Friday good, you've got to start with the shaming of Jesus. Let's move to the suffering of Jesus. The verse goes on. Verse number 35, and when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. There are five words in verse 35 of Matthew 27 that very simply, very non-assumingly paint a graphic and horrifying scene. When they had crucified him. The brevity that Matthew gives is like when you watch a movie and something happens oft Scene. It's there, you realize it happened, but it's horrific. Uh, the, the point is, he's almost sparing the reader here. Because if you were a first century reader, you knew what crucifixion was. And if you had seen crucifixion, you didn't need and you didn't want it explained. For anyone acquainted with the world of the first century, this was the most brutal and torturous form of death imaginable. Crucifixion. We literally have a word that comes from it. Excruciating. Brutal, bloody, horrifying. They whip him. They beat him. They drag him to the place of the skull. They drive nails into his nerve endings, which would have caused his body to tremble in pain. Crucifixion was kept for the worst. Barbarians and criminals. One theologian put it this way. Crucifixion was state 
state-sponsored and state-sanctioned terrorism. Crucifixion was not done in private. It was not done discreetly. It was done publicly to terrorize the populace from ever daring to form an opinion and stand up and rebel against Rome. I want you to think about the desired effect of crucifixion was much, much like a beheading video from ISIS. The point here is to stir up terror and fear. I can guarantee you crosses were not worn around necklaces. Crosses were not tattooed on arms. Crosses were not on t-shirts. Crosses were not on bracelets. This was an image of torture, agony, and pain. And then you see the perfect Lamb of God. The beautiful, innocent, perfect God-man, scourged, bloodied, and nailed naked to the cross. Unjust suffering at its finest. This was not a quick, easy, painless, honorable death. It was drawn out. The climactic point of the death of Jesus comes in verse 26 when he feels not just the physical pain, but the emotional, the spiritual, the relational being betrayed, of having the sin of the world placed on him, physical pain through the excruciating uh, cross, the judgment of God. In verse 46, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the worst suffering that's ever happened in humanity. Have you ever suffered before? I have a hunch that you have. A broken marriage, death of a child, dark night of the soul. I don't know what your suffering is, but I'm confident in this. Well-meaning cliches will not do. Numbing statements will not do. We've got to look at the cross. To every sufferer in this room, I want to remind you when that Jesus became sin for us, it meant he faced suffering. Number three, the death of Jesus, the darkest moment of it all. Verse 50 of the text says this, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. This is the darkest moment in human history, definitively. The light just completely went out. God was just killed by man. Wickedness seems to have conquered here. Humanity has been plunged into darkness. And I, I got to say this, when you read Matthew 27, our reaction should be, we can't come back from that. We just killed the God-man. Killed the very one who came to save us. We will all die. But in Matthew 27, the king just died. And you're next. But then something happens in verse 50. And there's wording of utmost importance because right in the middle of this dark cloud of horror, there's a little bit of this phrasing that starts to shine hope. It says he yielded up his spirit. It means he died willingly. He gives his life. No man can take it. He yields up his spirit. No one can take it. If Jesus gave it up by his own power, we're going to see that Jesus can take it back. And lastly, my friends, if we want to see what it means that why we call Good Friday good, we have to look at the fact that the victory of Jesus happens. Verse 51 says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Matthew begins to clue us in on something in these verses, mainly something cosmic, something historical, something just happened. This was not just the death of a mere suffering criminal, a mere man. In verse 51, it says the temple of the curtain was torn, meaning the barrier between God and man had just been split. See, the point of the earthquake, the point of the tombs, the point of the raised bodies, the, the split curtain is quite simple. The plot to destroy Jesus did not work. And this is when we as readers need to start realizing that there was two plots happening simultaneously in this text. There was a demonic plot and a divine plot. 
This was a demonic inspired man made plot to take down this prince of life. The Jewish elites, the Roman soldiers conspire not with man, but as the scripture tells us, Satan himself entered into Judas the betrayer. This was treason, not of the highest form of human court, but of the highest darkness of the demonic realm. And they start to celebrate. They start to dance on the grave of Jesus because they misplayed it. They didn't realize there was another plot happening at the exact same time. The plot of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. See, the scriptures tell us that the plan the whole time was for Jesus to die. You see, the forces of, di of darkness had misplayed their hands. Because as the demonic forces conspired to break Jesus' body, God was conspiring to make you whole. As they conspired to put him to death, God was conspiring to bring you to life. As they conspired to condemn Jesus, God was conspiring to cleanse you. As they bound and nailed him to the cross, God was conspiring to free you. And as they put him in the ground and threw a party because they thought the Prince of Life was dead forever, God was conspiring once and for all to make sure that that grave, to make sure that that tomb was the most ill-used tomb in human history because he would come back to life as Colossians 2.15 says, he put them to open shame, the demonic rulers and authorities, by triumphing over them in the cross. Don't see him as a victim on the cross. See him as a victor who took the very worst the enemy had to offer. See him like a fighter in the ring who ties his own hands behind his back and takes the very worst beating possible for 15 rounds. And at the end of it, he stands there with a, with a black and blue eye and a broken nose and a dislocated jaw and a bloody lip. And he, a smile breaks on his face. And he makes eye contact. And he said, is that the best you've got? Jesus defeats shame suffering and death through dying for our sins. That's what he did. What are you going to do? There's two simple pleas I want to give you tonight. Number one, come to the cross. Let me rephrase that. Run to the cross. If you're here tonight, you must run. You must not put it off. Call upon Christ right now in your seat. There's no other option when you look at the cross. And when you do, you'll bring just your sin like I did, like Pastor Trailer did, like all the brothers and sisters in the sermon. We bring nothing but our sin and we lay it there and he gives us his righteousness. For those of us who have come to the cross, come to the table. I want you to think about the church as a table seated on a bloody cross. And all are welcome, and all have a place, and there's bread, and there's the cup, and there's family, and there's serious joy at this table, serious because we understand just what it costs to get our seat. We don't take it lightly. But there's joy because there's a feast. And our Father sits at the head and we're forgiven and our shame is gone and our suffering has a meaning. And we look around and there's brothers and there's sisters and there's, and there's the promise that will never be cast from the table. We've got a new family and a new mission to go to the ends of the earth. All because for our sake, God made him who knew no sin to become sin. That Tim, that you might become the righteousness of God. That's why we call this Friday good. But I pray in a second, our pastor is about to come and lead us now into the table as we remember the cross. Let's pray. Jesus, we simply are in awe of you. Thank you. Thank you. As we move to the table now, Lord, let the beauty of your broken body and your shed blood not be lost on a single soul under the sound of my voice.
and God's people said in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. As we stand, we lift our eyes to the screen, and there you'll find our confession. Tim has helped us see it. That one verse he used. There's enough gospel dynamite there to blow the sin out of anybody's life. Glory to God. What a good word coming to us tonight. Thank you, preacher. We make our confession, and then we come to the table. And as we come, we will remember the broken body of our Lord, bruised and battered and bloody. We'll ask you to take that piece of bread and hold it. Remember the price that was paid. Then we'll pass the cup. We'll ask you to take it and hold it. And thank God for the blood shed at Calvary. We'll all take it together, symbolic of the unity of the faith that we have as a church and as the bride of Christ. Before we come there, let's make our confession of this that we believe. Join me as we make our confession. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the church of the living God, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we come to this place, this do, as the table says, in remembrance of me. We remember what the Lord did. And then examine yourself, as 1 Corinthians 11 says. If there's anything in your life that you need to deal with, as these elements are passed, confess it. This table calls us to remember and to repent. Remember what has been done. Oh, we've heard it preached to us. And then if there's anything in your life, confess. And if you confess, he will forgive come in repentance to the table. As our officers come and join me here, I will pray, and we will then ask these men to come and share the bread. You hold it, and we will then take it together, remembering the broken body of our Lord. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you. It's Good Friday, as we've heard. Lord, it's good because you died for us. It's good because the price was paid. We give you praise. We remember now. We repent. And we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. As you are seated, gentlemen, come and serve the bride.
remember the price paid, the excruciating execution. What a picture. All for you. Thank God for the cross. Remember and eat all of it. In the same way he took the cup after supper. And Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. How long? Until he comes again. Make no mistake. He's coming again. Remember, repent, and look up. You know not the hour. Until then, be grateful for the blood. Gentlemen, you come and let's serve the bride of Christ. Jesus 
no forgiveness without the blood life is in the blood eternal life in the blood of the lamb he shed his blood for us remember repent of any sin and rejoice that your name is written in the lamb's book of life take Remember and drink all of it. Glory to God. The Bible says after they had the supper, they sang a hymn and they went out. Well, before we go out, we have one other thing to do. We're going to send some people out. We already sent Ben out tonight. We're going to send him. Dakota Hill is going to come. We've ordained him, and I'm going to ask him to come and kneel right here in front of this table. And Cam stand behind him. And in a moment, some folks have been asked to come and pray over him. And so, Dakota, you kneel just here and face out that way and let your sweetheart stand right there by you. Those of you that are going to pray for him, you come just now. Lay your hands over on this young man as we set him aside. Those of you that have been asked to do that, couples coming and the ladies praying for Cam and those that have been asked to come and pray over to Cody you make your way here just now that's it good come and now you pray over this young man and ask God's favor to be on him tonight amen and amen okay you got another here he comes yes pray you pray for Dakota just ask the favor of God to rest on this young man hallelujah hallelujah
Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you that you call all of us to the cross for salvation. You call all of us to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation. And then, Lord, there are those among us that you call out in a vocational way to help guide and lead and shepherd your flock. And Lord Dakota is that young man. Just like this preacher we heard tonight is another. And Lord, I bring Dakota and Cam before you. And by faith, as they're under shepherd, we set them apart in this place called Olive Baptist Church. We ask for your unction, your filling, your protection, your power, and your wisdom to be on this young man as he ministers with us and to us and through us in the days ahead. We dedicate them now unto you. We do that by faith in Jesus' name. And all of the church together said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Well, it's always a good day when one of these young men set aside we send them out from here and we love them and thank God for them. Two weeks or a week from Sunday, the week after Easter, I am scheduled to preach up on the mountain. And on that day, I'm going to have three preachers. Dakota's going to preach at the 930 service. And Sean's going to preach at 11. And then Mike Dimmick's son-in-law is going to preach on the Warrington campus that day. And so uh, it takes about three to do my work around here. So uh, <laughs> they're going to preach all day that day, and it'll be good. You may never get out, all right? I don't know. But it'll be a good day, and Dakota will be praying for you as you break the Word of God open to that early service that day. It will be a glorious good day. They sang a hymn. They went out. As, as we go, we have much to do inviting friends to come and join us uh, on the Lord's Day. I've got several friends coming to be here uh, Easter morning. Looking forward to that. I'll be in the next chapter, chapter 28. The first word spoken by the resurrected Jesus. That's the title. And I'll be preaching that on Sunday morning in our services here. And we'll look forward to a glorious good day. But as we go out, we have other things to do. Coming up here, you don't want to miss what we're going to do with a play here about fentanyl. It's nuts what's going on in our culture. And we've got a great group. My good friends are going to come and share with us about how to overcome that. And uh, you'll want to be here on that night, on that Thursday, and it will be a great time. Now, tonight we had the Lord's Supper in three places. We took the Lord's Supper right here. Then they took the Lord's Supper down on the Warrington campus. That was a picture they sent to me a few moments ago. And then we had a group of deacons and staffers down at the Waterfront Rescue Mission doing the Lord's Supper at the Waterfront Mission tonight. <laughs> giving the gospel and people coming to faith in Christ. If you are here tonight without a church home and want to talk to somebody about that, go right out there to Next Steps. There's a big sign. You can't miss it. If you want to trust Jesus tonight, you've never been saved, as Tim talked about, Good Friday just for you. Go right out there and let someone pray with you about knowing the Lord this night. Not a better night to do it than on Good Friday. And if you just need someone to go in with you, pray with you, maybe a physical issue, a brokenness, a hurt, go. And some of our men, deacons will be out there and helping, and they'll be glad to kneel and pray with you in that place. 
Well, I've said six times they sang a hymn and went out, so I guess we ought to sing a hymn before we go out, Brother John. Let's stand together because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Let's sing it unto the Lord and unto his glory. Lift your voice. Amen. for the service at Olive Baptist Church. We're so glad you've chosen to be a part of our worship experience. To find out more about Olive, visit us at olivebaptist.org.